And over to you, Will. OK. Um, hopefully you can hear me and maybe see me as well. Thanks, everyone, for joining me today in this session. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the latest uh, DevOps and ALM updates um, for 2020. So these are typically uh, not the things that you see talked about most in the Wave 2 or Wave 1 release notes, but these are the things that the product team have been continuously working on and releasing them throughout the year. So sometimes you see them in blog posts, sometimes you see them in the docs documentation, sometimes uh, you just have to look at some of the tools uh, release notes to see some of this information. So I've tried to consolidate as much of these features or new updates as possible and put them in this session today. So hopefully um, you'll find some of this information useful. Uh, I'll also include some of the background in terms of what DevOps is in case you're not familiar uh, with the concept as well. So before I start, uh, obviously thank you to all the sponsors who are sponsoring this event. Um, so that's much appreciated. Um, um, the other thing I would like to mention is that um, uh, basically we are giving prizes at the end of the event. Uh, so there is, I think, two $50 Amazon vouchers. Uh, if you're um, sending uh, social media posts using the hashtag that you can see on the screen. Uh, and there's also one more prize, which is another $50 Amazon voucher for someone, for all the people who kind of submit the survey. We'll pick one of them at the end. So I'll put the link to the survey at the end of the session as well. So you can do that survey in the end. Um, so before I start, just a little bit of information about myself. Uh, so while Hamzi, I'm a Microsoft Business Solutions MVP. Uh, I've been working with the Microsoft technologies um, for over 15 years now. I think the names of the technologies uh, have changed. Um, I think there's a bit of background noise. If someone can go on mute, please. I, I, I don't know if one of the organizers maybe can mute the channel. <laughs> okay, but I, I'll continue in the meantime. So, um, yeah, basically, uh, I've started work with Microsoft CRM 1.2, um, and obviously we're, we're now using the uh, Power Platform. Um, so if, if you want to get in touch, uh, there's lots of information about Hi, Will. Uh, sorry, um, you're on mute there. OK, I'm th I think somehow I got muted, but hopefully you can hear me yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so let's just do a little bit of introduction into DevOps. Um, so think of DevOps as the process uh, from you know left to right, where left is from the time you get an idea or a requirement of something you want to implement, and you know the, and the right is where the requirement kind of lands in the hands of the users and they can kind of use it and get value out of it. So you typically start from you know defining your your backlog um, and then prioritizing that backlog. So planning is a very important stage in DevOps. Um, so this is typically where you prioritize your requirements and this is very important stage because if you don't get your requirement right, then no matter what you do after that you're likely not going to deliver what the users have asked so focusing on getting you know the requirements documented properly and checking that this is what the user wants is, is very important and then making sure you start as well with what the user thinks is the priority for them so so once the requirements are there then you tend to you know get a team that normally develops these requirements. Um, so whether these are citizen developers or developers in this case, so we tend to go to the power platform and then you know implement these requirements. And as part of DevOps, it's a good practice to store these uh, requirements in source control. And I'll show you throughout the session today on, on how you can do that. Once the requirements are in source control or submitted by the developer, then there's a typically a peer review process um, depending on the size of the team. So this is where someone else in the team may have a look at what you've done and then decide, you know, 
uh, whether there are any cha further changes are required. Uh, once that review is done, then you go and have an automated build. Um, so in DevOps, you don't want to do too many manual steps. Um, so what tends to happen is, you know, for example, you press a button and then all the solutions get exported and packaged and then become available for you to consume. Uh, and then after that, uh, once we have the solutions, we want to um, basically deploy these solutions somewhere so we can check whether they're working or not. Um, so as part of DevOps, uh, you tend to spin up environments sometimes on the fly or manage your existing environments as part of the automation. Um, so once you deploy the solutions, which is typically involved um, in terms of importing the solutions and then doing any other manual steps, um, then you can test the solutions to make sure that they work in the target environment. And once all the different testing cycles complete, you tend to release uh, uh, the solutions to uh, a production environment. So this could be either like a power platform production environment that is accessible to the users where you'd have a change control process. Or if you are a partner, for example, you could be releasing something to the marketplace or you know, uh, making that available to the customer. Um, and one of the important next phases is the monitoring. So once you release something, you want to monitor and get feedback. And then after that, you want to then make sure that you take that feedback and then put it back into the planning stage. So then the cycle starts over again. And in DevOps, you want to make sure that all these steps are as automated as possible. And you know, left to right should be very quick. It's it's not a matter of month as we kind of used to in 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 the past. It should be, you know, a matter of days or weeks. You know, going through all that cycle. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of introduction into DevOps. Um, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the Power Platform development. Um, so in the Power Platform development, you tend to have two kind of scenarios or use cases. Um, so, so one of them is the citizen developer. Uh, so these are, um, you know, the people that you know log into the Power Apps Maker portal and they can quickly uh, develop solutions um, to meet business requirements very quickly. And then we have the other kind of use case, which is the developer. And the developer typically kind of takes the Power Platform into the next uh, level from a complexity point of view. So they typically write code and extend the platform to make it, uh, you know, suitable for very specific business requirements that you can't achieve, you know, via typical customizations. And the developers typically work in Visual Studio. They store things in source control, and then, you know, the citizen developers or the customizers, um, you know, they tend to kind of work in the maker portal. And the challenge becomes, you know, how do we get, you know, different people with different roles on the same team, kind of working together, and then. Um, coordinating all these changes together. So let's take a look at uh, how we can use source control to manage all the changes, not only from the citizen developer, but also from the developer. So typically, um, uh, the citizen developer will go into a CDS environment, open the specific solution that they want to make changes in, and then you know they will make whatever configurations they need to do. Um, typically, they don't want to go anywhere near source control because that's not the level of detail that they're interested in. Uh, and then we have the developers, so they typically build plugins, web resources, you know, custom connectors, um, all the things that require code. They use Visual Studio. Uh, they they would deploy these things into the CDS environment um, or the CDS development environment, and then um, make sure it works. And then once they make sure it works, then they commit it into source control. So at this point, we have a little bit, little bit of a gap because the changes from the uh, customizer, they're not in source control yet. So we need to define a process somewhere that then takes these changes from the customizer and stores that into source control. And that process you know, could be automated, uh, could be manual. It really depends how far you want to go. But what typically happens is we need to export a process. Um, we have a process to export the solution. And then once we export the solution that we want to unpack it into a format that is, you know, able to store it in source control and then we push these changes into source control so this way we've we've got the configuration changes and the source code that the developers write all all in one place into source control and once these changes are into source control then we can have our automated processes that then package these changes from source control so and then release it to a number of different environments so source control should be really our kind of uh, golden source or the or the master of the truth so, so this is, I'll show you an example later on in the presentation on how you can achieve that practically. Um, 
So let's take a look at some of the uh, DevOps tools that are available for you today uh, to start automating all these manual steps that you may be still doing manually on your projects. Um, so, so one of the tools is the Power Platform Build Tools. So this tool was initially released as a preview in 2019, but there is the kind of general release um, earlier in June in 2020. Um, so this tool is uh, released by Microsoft and it supports Dynamics uh, 365 and Power Apps. And it contains 16 different tasks. Um, and that tool works only with Azure DevOps. So in terms of the core functionality of this tool, uh, it allows you to export import solutions. It also has some tasks to pack and unpack, which is basically storing the solutions from source control. Um, it has some tasks for package deployments. So this is where you want to add some custom steps into your um, uh, deployments, or if you have more than one solution. Uh, we have tasks for the solution checker, which basically allows you to um, scan your solutions for best practices and highlight you know, what things you may be doing in your solutions that don't align with best practices. So it helps you fix some potential performance issues or um, it will help you avoid some of the problems you may come uh, to face later down the line. Um, there is some utilities as well that you can use for versioning and uh, finally it allows you to manage your environment. So whether it's creating a new environment, taking a backup or resetting uh, an existing environment. So it, it gives you a good set of core tasks that you can use in your pipelines. So it gets you, you know, most of the automation done, in, you know, using these tasks. So I'm just going to quickly um, show you an example of a pipeline using that tool. So let's go into a quick demo. So this is the Power Apps um, and the, or the Power Platform Build tool. So you can get it free from the marketplace and you can see, you know, there's lots of documentation in here. Um, and you can, there's links to further documentation as well. Um, so let's take a look at an example pipeline that you can use, for example. So this is a very simple pipeline that just exports the solution uh, and makes it available for uh, deployment. So let's take a look at how this works. Um, so typically you have to add um, a Power Platform tool installer task. So this is just uh, gets all the tools ready uh, for you to, um, so for example, the set solution task we will rely on a number of libraries that uh, this tool installer provides. So you always have to put it as the first step in the task. Um, so in this case, I'm just setting the version of the solution and uh, you can use parameters to set your kind of solution names. Um, you can select your connection in here. And one of the things uh, that you see that you probably may not be aware of is there is a new way of authenticating to your CDS environment. So now you can use um, client secret authentication. And this is very important because um, username and password uh, would no longer work in the future um, because of added securities for things like MFA may be enforced and things like that. So you probably want to use client secret to authenticate. So that's a good addition into the tool set uh, from a supportability point of view. So the next step is exporting the solution. So again, you just provide the solution name and then you know decide whether you want it um, export it as a managed solution or a manager. Then finally, you publish the artifact, which basically means that you know this solution is now available as a stored artifact for deployment. So if we just go back, um, I'm just going to show you an, uh, a sample execution of that pipeline. So I've executed this pipeline earlier, so you can see everything succeeded. So you can kind of drill down if you want to do the details of what happened on each step. Um, one of the other things you can see is that there is a published artifact. So this is the uh, solution that I exported, uh, and you can then create a release pipeline, you know, using a similar mechanism to import that solution into the uh, test environment. So, so that's the Power Platform tools at a glance. Um, I'll take questions in the end, um, but if you have any burning questions, you know, feel free to put them in the chat, and maybe someone can ask me. Okay, so let's go back into the presentation. So, so the next uh, tool set that you can use, um, there's lots of tools in the marketplace, by the way, so feel free to have a look. Uh, there's lots of community tools you can use. One of the most uh, used tools is the Power DevOps tools. Um, 
So this was released in 2017. Um, so I've kind of highlighted and bold some of the features that um, you can't do uh, at the moment with the Power Platform Build tools. Um, so if you've got these additional use cases, uh, you can utilize these tools to kind of meet these use cases. So for example, if you're on-premise, um, the Power DevOps tools will work uh, with most kind of on-premise versions. Um, and it's also free and open source on GitHub. Um, so you can uh, look at the source code, you can raise issues there, you can contribute if you like. Um, and this tool uh, contains 47 tasks. Um, so it's got most of the things that the Power Platform Build tools has, but I'm gonna highlight just some additional things. So for example, when you're importing solutions, uh, you have the option to apply um, the upgrade. Um, so that means you can do a two-stage process. So you can import the solution uh, in a holding position, and then you can pause, and then you've got a special task to apply the upgrade after you're comfortable that you want to apply the upgrade. Um, solution checker, it gives you a little bit more options in terms of being able to skip certain files uh, and have a little bit more control on in terms of what you want to scan and using what rules uh, if you have very specific requirements. In terms of environments management, it allows you to set the admin mode on the environment, which can be useful sometimes if you don't want people doing things on the environment while you're in the middle of the release. It has some additional utilities as well. Um, so you can deploy plugins, uh, you can update web resources and things like that. Um, it has also more functions relating to solutions. So you can create solutions, update the solution, delete the solution. You can copy components between solutions. You can run some checks on the solutions as well. Um, and finally, you've got things like managing reference data. So if you're using the configuration migration utility, uh, it has tasks that allows you to export the data from your dev environment and then uh, you know, store it in source control and then import it you know, using your pipelines. And it's got other features kind of related to configuration. So things like managing the environment variables and you know, service endpoint for plugins if you've got a slightly different configuration between the environments, so you can cater for these kind of use cases. Uh, so that, that's the power, you know, DevOps tools at a quick glance. So I'm just going to jump to demo just to show you an example of how you can use that. So let's go into the portal again. So again, Power DevOps tools is available in the marketplace. You know, you can have a look at, you know, what it actually uh, contains in terms of the task and the release notes, uh, everything is, is in here. Um, so let's take a look at the sample pipeline. So in the previous pipeline, I've kind of exported the solution from the environment directly and I made that available as an artifact. In this specific pipeline, I'm actually uh, have the customizations in source control already. So I'm going to package the customizations from source control. So I'm going to just quickly show you how that looks like. Um, so let's take a quick look. Um, so this one is a little bit more developer oriented pipeline because it's got source code and uh, <clears throat> automated testing as well. So the first thing that we're doing is kind of building the source code, uh, running some unit tests. Uh, we've also got uh, the tool installer, so that's very important. You can use that task um, to uh, you know, make sure that the tools are available for the remaining tasks. So I set the version of the solution before I package the solution, but instead of kind of setting this version of the solution in the Dynamics environment, uh, the changes are already in source control. So I have to just to point uh, to my customizations that are already available in source control. Um, and then I use uh, the pack task, which is basically taking all the customizations from source control and generating a solution package. Uh, and then I run the, um, the Power Apps checker so I provide that solution zip that I just packed, and I use that to, you know, run the uh, different checks on the solution. And you can see some of the additional options that I mentioned earlier with regards to this task. So you can exclude certain files, uh, you can override rules, and you know things like that. Uh, and finally, um, there is a different task as well. Uh, so this task allows you to fail the build um, if for example, you have more than five high rules. So if you've got certain practices in your team where you want to keep, for example, all these um, different uh, bad practices, for example, into minimum, then you can set these thresholds in your pipeline. It will block changes kind of getting moving forward until someone fixes these. Um, 
Um, and then, yeah, I finally published all the artifacts as well. So, so this is a very simple pipeline, just takes everything from source control, runs some checks, uh, some tests, and then makes the artifact available uh, for deployment. So let's quickly take a look on how this looks like. Um, so, so you can see, for example, there is scans in the top. So this is the um, Power Apps Checker. So you can see some of the um, uh, things that it found, for example, in this solution. So in this case, I have a plugin that is retrieving all the columns. And uh, as per the best practices, you shouldn't be retrieving all columns because it's not the best thing for performance. So you should be selecting the specific columns that you need to use in your business process. Um, we have the uh, tests as well. So you can see all the automated tests running. Uh, and similar to the previous pipeline, you know, we also have, you know, the solution that was generated uh, from source control. And again, if you want to see the details in terms of what happened, you can go uh, and specifically check. So you get a full audit uh, of you know what things were executed on that environment. Okay. Um, so that's a quick intro uh, into Power DevOps tools. Um, so let's continue. Um, <clears throat> so the next things I'm I'm going to be talking to you about is um, GitHub Actions. So the the first tools I mentioned, you know. I'm sure most people are familiar with them. GitHub Actions is something that is uh, very new. So, so the preview uh, of these tools was released in September this year. So it's it's fairly new, and the GitHub Actions are still in preview. So what GitHub Actions are is similar to the. Uh, kind of Azure DevOps extensions where it gives you some utilities to automate your pipelines on Azure DevOps. GitHub Actions is the same thing, but it works for GitHub. And there is lots of um, new things happening in the GitHub space. So there is lots of investment and you know the product is becoming uh, you know very rich in terms of tool sets for managing backlog, but also now for automating pipelines uh, in addition to um, you know, source control, which I'm sure what most people would be kind of familiar with. So GitHub Actions also kind of support the same kind of uh, latest dynamics and you know Power Platform releases as the uh, Power Platform build tools. Uh, so this is managed by Microsoft. And um, initially, we have seven actions that are part of the preview. So you can uh, import and export solutions. Uh, and you can also pack and unpack, which is you know managing the source control. Uh, but there is two new actions that I haven't seen, for example, in the Power Platform build tool. So these are the branch and clone. So I'll actually show you how this works today. Um, there are things like environments management and solution checker, which are expected mm -hmm. to come in this October, and probably there'll be more things that will be coming, you know, later down the line. Uh, but before I jump into the demo, I just wanted to quickly show you um, or talk to you about, you know, what are GitHub Actions in a little bit more detail. So in terms of Azure DevOps, uh, in Azure DevOps, we have, you know, the concept of the build and release. So they are two separate things. And then we have the concept of the pipelines, which is like a one process that kind of does build, release and everything all together. So in GitHub Actions, we have the concept of workflows. Um, so think, think of a workflow as a series of steps that does a number of things, and, they are, and that is automated. Um, so a workflow basically um, will contain uh, a number of jobs. Um, so jobs can run in parallel or they can run sequentially. Um, so jobs is like a grouping of steps, um, and then steps will typically contain the actions. So the actions are like the smallest kind of building blocks that you can use to perform certain steps like importing or exporting solutions. So in GitHub Actions, the pipelines are configured in YAML, which is in code. Um, so you, you configure everything in code and you have everything in source control. So you so so you have not only like your source in source control, but you also have the definition of your automated processes in source control. Um, now, the, all these workflows tends to have events. So event, think of the event is like, you know, what's the trigger of that workflow? 
Uh, now, the, the advantage of GitHub Actions is you got a lot more triggers than uh, Azure DevOps. So you can trigger a number of events uh, or workflows on the things like you wouldn't be able to do very easily in Azure DevOps. So you can trigger, for example, a workflow when somebody assigns a, an issue or you can trigger a workflow whenever a release gets created. So that gives you a lot more kind of flexibility in terms of what you can automate and in, under what kind of conditions to meet, you know, the different scenarios that you may have. So the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, there's lots of actions in the marketplace. Uh, so not only the actions for the Power Platform, but you can also combine them with lots of actions uh, from the community or from the different vendors to kind of meet your overall requirements. Um, and as with kind of um, kind of multi operating system uh, strategy, you know you can run these uh, workflows on Windows. You can run them on um, on the Mac or Linux. So it's very flexible in terms of where you can run them. Um, I think at the moment the GitHub Actions for the Power Platform only run on Windows. But if you've got other technologies uh, that you may be integrating with with the Power Platform, you can use the GitHub Actions as well in there. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an intro into GitHub Actions. Um, hopefully it will start to make more sense as well once I show you um, a practical example. So let me go back into the uh, portal. Um, so if I take a look at, for example, let's go into the Maker portal. Um, so I have this solution, which is, um, you know, in, in, in the um, dev environment. Um, so in this case, I'm going to make a change to that solution. So you see today, I'm not going to be using Visual Studio. So I'm kind of playing the role of the uh, citizen developer. Um, so let's assume I want to add a uh, new field into the system. Um, so let's just create a new field called Wave 2. Uh, and I, when I click Done, I just save this entity. Um, so that will basically create me a new field. And it's a very simple requirement, but I think we can use that to kind of demonstrate the purpose. So, so once I'm happy, I know, I know I'll publish all my changes. And then, and then at this point, as a citizen developer, um, I'm kind of hoping that my changes will somehow land in source control. Um, so for this demo, um, basically I have a sample project on GitHub. So this project has been around for a while now, um, as you can tell from the name Dynamics 365 CE. Um, so basically it contains like a sample project that has, you know, some plugins, some configurations. Um, so you can see that the changes, um, I've already got some changes in source control, which is kind of storing, you know, what entities I'm using in this solution, etc. So I've already got some changes. So now I want to do is I want to get my updates that I've just done into source control without having to do too much work. Um, so, so basically what I need to do is I need to go into the, into the actions tab. So this is where my GitHub actions are. And I have something here, um, which is a workflow, which is called uh, create a pull request. So I've done some changes. I want to submit these changes for someone else to review. So I'll go in here and I'll raise a pull request. So all I have to do is just uh, run this workflow from here. And that's going to start executing uh, this workflow. So while the workflow is executing, I'm just going to show you what the workflow is doing. So we can take a look at the workflow file and hopefully, you know, it may not be very clear, but hopefully you can kind of tell, tell what's happening. Um, again, I've created this workflow, you know, using this browser. I didn't have to go anywhere. Um, so I've just used uh, some of the um, labs that are available uh, as well for GitHub Actions. Um, so there's lots of documentation that is published on the docs and there are some practical examples in terms of how you that you can follow in terms of how you can configure uh, these actions for your project so there's there is documentation that is very useful just to get you started quickly so i've made some slight modifications to these for this specific demo so all i'm doing basically is uh, i think i think the core things to focus on is 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 you know how you define your events so this is kind of saying that I want to trigger this process manually, but you could trigger it on commit. Um, <clears throat> you can specify where it's going to run. So I'm saying I want to run it on the latest kind of Windows machine. Um, 
this is using the hosted GitHub um, kind of runner. Uh, but if you have any specific requirements where you want to, for example, run it on your own infrastructure, you can do that as well. So the next step is checking out the code, uh, which is fairly standard process. Uh, there is like a ping request in terms of, you know, can I connect to the CRM environment? It, it's always a good idea to do that, especially if you're starting up. Uh, just to make sure that you know things are getting connected and working. Uh, the main thing is exporting the solution. So, so to export a solution, actually, it's very simple. All you just have to do is just you know paste this uh, few lines of uh, YAML. So you specify the environment URL, the username, the password, the solution name, and where you want to store it. Uh, <clears throat> you might be wondering where these secrets are coming from. Uh, so things like username, password, you probably want. Um, to be encrypted, but because this is a public repo, I've also encrypted the URL. So if you go into your repo settings, you can see uh, you can define your secrets very clearly in here. So you can you know specify different information uh, or kind of fixed parameters that you want to use in your pipelines. Um, and the next step is again to export the managed version of the solution, and then we use the unpack task. So this is basically taking the output of the export and is asking. The system to store it in this folder in version control. Um, and one of the important things that's happening now in this task is the branch task. So this is a new task. So basically what it's going to do is it's going to you know take the output of the uh, customizations that were kind of unpacked into source control and it's going to, to create a personal branch for me and I can then I can use that branch to create a pull request. So so let's take a look at this action to see whether it's completed. Um, I think the job is probably still running. Uh, no, it's done. Uh, so you can see uh, this action got completed. Um, so I can click on that, um, and if I want, really, I can I can start drilling into the details to you know to see what happens. But in this case, uh, I'm just interesting interested in submitting these changes. So if I go into my pull request. I want to create a new pull request, um, so I'll click on create a new pull request. Um, and again, creating the pull request is a manual process that I'm doing, but uh, you know there are ways to automate that as well. So I can see that there is a new branch that has been created with some changes uh, two minutes ago, so that's the one I'm going to pick. If I pick that, uh, it actually shows me the changes that were done. So in this case, you can see that I've added a wave two field on the contact entity. You can see the contact entity. So it gives you a very clear understanding in terms of what has changed uh, as a result of this requirement, which is useful uh, if you want to go back in time and actually see why something is not working or why what somebody did on a specific day for a specific requirement. So in this case, I'm just going to submit this pull request. Um, so I'll create the pull request. You can obviously link it to different issues and you know different tags and things like that, which I'm not going to do today. Um, but the next step is that review process. So once someone reviews that pull request, they're happy with it. Um, you know, you can merge the pull request. Uh, you can skip that review process already. You can create a path and just commits to your master branch. Uh, but I just wanted to show you the uh, branch task in this case. Um, so once that change is committed into the master branch, uh, now we should have all the new customizations in source control. Um, so if we go back to my actions now, um, let's take a look. So there is another action that's been triggered, and that's called the create CDS pipeline. So now that I have my latest changes in source control, what I want to do is I want to package these changes and then deploy them into the to, into a number of environments. So let's take a look. Um, so if I want to click on this build, um, let's take a look quickly at the workflow file. So again, this one is a very similar one to the previous one. Uh, the main steps that you probably need to be uh, aware of is the pack solution. So this is where I'm saying actually my configurations are in this folder and I want to generate this solution zip from that folder. And then I want to publish these changes as, as an artifact. So very, very straightforward. And once you have the artifact, then you can start to deploy that you know, into a number of environments. Um, so hopefully um, this thing will finish. So it's finished now, so I can click on it. And you can see the artifacts in here. So I've got the solution zip uh, published as an artifact, so I can then deploy that. So hopefully that gave you 
you know, some idea in terms of what GitHub Actions are and, you know, how you can use it or start to use them. Um, and, you know, there's lots of opportunities, I think, with GitHub Actions, and I think you'll probably see more of them and more ways of using them, you know, going forward. So at this point, I'm going to, you know, jump back into the presentation. Um, because I think there's a few more things that I wanted to show you before we kind of start looking at questions. So PowerShell tools. Um, so if you're familiar with the online management API, basically this is a PowerShell module that allows you to kind of manage your environments from PowerShell. Um, so this module, I wanted to let you know that this is module has been deprecated now. Um, I also wanted to show you that there has been a 44 million downloads of this module in the last eight months. Um, so there's lots of people using it basically, so it's important to start um, transitioning some of the scripts that you may already be using into kind of more strategic uh, modules. So the next one is the Power Apps Admin Commandlets. Uh, so this is kind of the equivalent of the Online Management API. It gives you a little, a little bit more functionality as well. So that was in preview, so that's now generally available. So again, you can use that to manage your environments. Uh, it gives you some extra stuff like managing your Canvas apps and flows and you know DLP policies. Um, so this is for admins. There is another module for makers. So if you're a maker and you want to automate some of these tasks as well, um, such as for example adding a Canvas app to a solution or kind of you know uh, managing your flows, disabling, enabling, you can do that as well through this module. And you can easily utilize these modules on your developer machine or in your pipelines, you know, or, or, or wherever you want to write automation jobs. Um, another module you can use uh, is the Power Apps Checker Commandlets. So if you have very specific requirements and you think that the Azure DevOps tools uh, or the GitHub Actions, you know, don't work for you, or maybe you're using Jenkins or something else, you can use the PowerShell module to do that. Um, um, to basically check your solutions. Um, and finally, uh, I've showed you the Power DevOps tools. Uh, the Power DevOps tool is actually built on top of the uh, Microsoft SDK libraries and tools, but also on top of the XRM CI framework. So this is a list of you know, scripts and commandlets that you know, give you access to the common kind of steps you normally would face when automating builds or deployments. So to give you an example, for example, um, there is a script to uh, export a solution. There is a script to extract data from an environment uh, or to kind of modify configuration data. And I think this framework is especially useful for you if you're um, kind of not using Azure DevOps uh, because um, you will have to script a lot of things manually. So it just gives you a head start and will help you with lots of utilities if you're doing that. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, new features. Um, so one of them is the async export. Um, so before, um, from an API point of view, there was one API called export solution. Um, so you call that, give it a solution name, it gives you back the zip file. Uh, now there are problems with that, and especially recently. Um, so in a number of cases, you used to get timeouts, uh, you know, or the API wasn't stable. Um, so there is a new way of doing things now, which is called the async solution export. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit complicated um, to kind of do if you're writing code, but you know all the kind of the Power DevOps tools and the Power Platform tools give you the ability to do async exports now. And and the way this works is you there is a new API called um, export solution async where you give it the solution ID or the name, and, and now it gives you an async job and an export job. So then uh, you can use the async job to wait until the export happens in the backend. And then once that is completed, then you use the export job to download the zip file. Um, so, it, you know, there's a number of APIs going in here, uh, but the benefits is now the export is a lot more stable and there is no timeouts. Um, so I, I think I, I think is a step in the right direction. Um, so the next thing is environment variables. Um, you may be using these already, but they are now generally available. Um, so these are designed so you don't hard code hard code information in your kind of you know in your apps or or flows. Uh, you could use custom entities in the past, but that's not the best way of managing things. So environment variables gives you an out of the box capability to do that. So it's basically two entities. 
one of them is the definition of the environment variable, which is like, you know, what type is the environment variable? And, um, you know, if you want to specify a default value, you can do that. And then there's another entity which stores the actual value. And the advantages of this approach is you can add the definition to the solution, but you don't have to add the value to the solution because the values will be typically different per environments. Um, so it, it just gives you that separation and it gives you an out of the box functionality to, to, to manage this as well. Um, you can obviously add these into the solutions and you know they're supported by Power Apps and Flows. And if you're using the Power Apps, um, or the or the Power DevOps tools, you can um, you know set these values in your pipelines as well as you import your solutions. Um, so the next feature I'm going to talk about is connection references. Um, so connections are basically unique per environment. So if you're doing flows or apps, you know you may be connecting to a number of external data sources, and these connections tend to be unique per environment. So if you're in Dev, you may be linking to the Dev instance. If you're in Prod, you may be linking to a, you know a Prod instance. Um, so before um, we used to have uh, a slight problem because the solution um, or the flow itself, let's take an example as a flow, would have a direct dependency on the connection. So when you take a flow out of the development environment and then you import that into your test environment, uh, then you would have to rewire that connection because the connection doesn't get exported as part of the solution. And once you rewire that connection, then that creates an unmanaged layer. And then when you import the update to that flow, then you may not see the updates. Um, so it, it was a little bit challenging kind of implementing ALM in this scenario. So the new way of doing it is there's a connection reference concept. Um, so instead of having basically a direct dependency from a component on the connection, there is like an intermediary entity. Um, and that entity contains a little bit more information. So, so what you add to the solution is not only the component, which is like flow, but you also add the connection reference. And that connection reference gets transported as part of the solution. So you no longer have a dependency on the connection directly. So the flow or the power app will remain unchanged uh, as you update your connection references and, and your connection. So the next time you import a flow, it will basically work. Um, and then you will see the latest updates. So. The other thing I wanted to mention as well is the new solution import experience. So if you're using the uh, Power Platform Admin Center, you may have noticed this, but it's just worth mentioning. So there is a number of capabilities that come with that. So one of them is it allows you to set your connection references when you're importing the solution. Um, so when you're importing a new solution into, for example, a test environment, if you have a flow that uses, you know, uh, let's say the Outlook connector, uh, you can set that Outlook connection as you import the solution. Um, and if you have environment variables, for example, uh, that are utilized uh, by one of your apps, you can also set that as part of the solution import. Um, so basically, you're basically setting up everything as you're importing the solution, and it's getting set up in a way that it doesn't you know, create unmanaged layers. So everything is kind of uh, managed properly. And this is how it looks like. So you get prompted for this dialogue actually before you import the solution or as you are importing it before the import starts. Um, so if you've got an environment variable that doesn't have a value or, um, for example, a connection that hasn't been previously wired in a previous import, uh, the system will prompt you and it will ask you to provide these details. Uh, I believe there should be some capabilities coming in the future that would allow you to do the same using your pipelines and the SDK, but I haven't seen this yet, or maybe I'm not aware of them at the point. Um, so finally, uh, some more features for you. So this is the CDS instance admin mode. Um, so, so this is what we used to have before, basically. Um, so you used to be able to set the admin mode on, an, on a sandbox instance. So if you're deploying to a test environment or if you're doing some maintenance on that environment, you used to be able to set it in admin mode, which means nobody can do anything on it and potentially workflows and plugins may not run during that period. But if you had to do that on the production, I think the process was a bit more complicated. So you had to switch your production instance into sandbox. Uh, then you have to set the admin mode and then you have to take it out of the admin mode and then you have to take it, put it back into the production mode. And as a result of that, you may lose some of the backups because I think the retention period may be different between these two types of instances. Um, obviously, the process is a little bit 
complicated as well and you know you know you may get it wrong at some point um, so now I think you can set the admin mode on production environments directly so that experience is simplified and you can do that from your pipelines as well um, so finally I wanted to mention that um, in case you haven't seen it there's lots of documentation online I think previously you had to hunt down for these different kind of um, ALM practices and tools um, so you have to kind of do your own research but now uh, all the documentation relating to how to best uh, adapt and implement ALM and DevOps on the Power Platform is available in the docs you know it's in one place so you can easily go there and you know take a look at that um, I just uh, just a quick summary before I wrap up and open for questions as you can see, the CDS and the Power Platform is uh, coming up with new features that would make it uh, more possible to implement uh, DevOps on the Power Platform, such as the connection references and you know, environment variables and things like that. And we we'll probably expect that to continue over time. Um, we have lots of new tools on different platforms. Um, so you can use like first class tools like extensions for Azure DevOps and GitHub, or you can go to the PowerShell modules if you wanted to get more flexibility or use different platforms. Um, you also have lots of documentation. There's lots of more community content as well in terms of tools, blogs, videos, um, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, so it's very easy to kind of go and take a look um, to get started. Um, and finally, all of the above make it more easy for you to implement these practices on your projects. Um, so with that said, I think hopefully you've been sharing um, your social media posts using the hashtag. Um, and then I'm going to be putting the link on, on, on my screen relating to the survey. Um, so please feel free to submit a survey um, because um, I think it's important to provide feedback so we can improve this event going forward, but also it gives you a chance to win, you know, one of the $50 Amazon vouchers. Uh, the only thing is you have to be present in, in, in the closing session. So looking forward uh, to see you there. Any, any questions? I think there may have been a number of questions on the chat, which I can't see them, but if, Thank uh, you, Will. Uh, yes, so uh, just a first question from Ganesh. Okay. Uh, the question goes, how to overcome the challenge with custom connectors? Because it breaks every time when we deploy a solution using DevOps. We have flows and power apps that need to use custom connectors. To, to be honest, I haven't worked too much with custom connectors, um, so I, I'm not sure if I can uh, answer this question. But if, 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 if it's something that you're struggling with, uh, please feel free to reach out to me offline with your specific questions, and I'll try and find the answer for you. Yeah, I'd really encourage that because um, these questions came through as you were going through the presentation and mm -hmm. um, they were related to specific things. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if you can pick this one out. Okay. Dash has asked, is it support rollback mechanism if after deployment certain functionality failed? Um, I mean, there is a number of ways you can do rollback. Um, I mean, there are ways to back up the environment um, so you can if you back up your environment before the deployment i think the system takes now regular backups anyway but it is good to have a label before you start the deployment so if you do take that backup and then you realize you know shortly after the deployment that things are not working then you can go into the power platform admin center or you can have an automated flow and you can you know restore the previous version of the environment obviously if you've made changes outside of cds then you need to worry about how to restore these changes as well, not only the changes within CDS. I think if you're using patches or something like that, you can delete the patch as well. So that's another way of doing things if you've got a very small change going on. That's great, thank you. Uh, Ferez asked, how can we add trigger to launch, for example, export pipeline and after that import pipeline? Um, 
I, I'm not sure which technology this question is specifically relating to, but mm -hmm. in, in general, it's it's easy, whichever technology you're using, whether Azure DevOps or GitHub, in terms of putting automated triggers for things. Um, so you could export, for example, you could have a build that exports a solution and have a, and have a release that has an automated trigger whenever a build is available or a, you know, a change is committed into source control to start and then deploy to the test environment. So if you really wanted to, you could have one pipeline that automates everything from the point of checking into production. But uh, I'm sure you would probably want to include some checks or manual intervention on the way. Mm. Here's one question from Cole. What do you think of Microsoft's suggestion to use a build server to import unmanaged solution from source and output and output a managed solution as a build artifact? What benefits do you see? Uh, it's a it's a very good question. Um, it's probably something I need to um, uh, check with Microsoft as well at some point in terms of the, the reason behind uh, this such su suggestions. Uh, what, what I've typically done, for example, in, in, in a number of projects is if if if, if using source control. Um, so, for example, you, when you, when you store your changes into source control, you can uh, store them as both managed and unmanaged. So you can select that you know the option. And then you've got the option of generating either a managed or a managed solution from source control. Uh, and that typically works and you can deploy it into a number of different environments. Uh, I think the build environment can sometimes be useful from a concept of the build environment. If uh, you've got lots of, for example, citizen developers that um, are, for example, working in solutions. So you can move these solutions into the build environment and then you can export and store your changes uh, from the build environment. So in a way, you could treat your build environment as you know, a, a more stable version of your changes than the development environment. Um, and in this case, you can generate you know, your source control uh, code from there. Um, so that's another way of, for example, why you may have a build environment. I probably hasn't answered your question directly, but I probably gave, gave you two alternatives that you could uh, work with. <laughs> yeah, here's another one from Cole as well. Um, do you have any strategies for keeping any non-D365 dependencies in line with CDS? Example, Azure functions, uh, separate pipelines mean things might get out of sync. Okay. Uh, I think it really depends on how things work on your project. Uh, and so it's probably another good question. Uh, Phil keeps asking, asking uh, good <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, I think if you if you have if you have, for example, your Azure functions separate than your Dynamics, for example, pipeline. I think the advantage with that is uh, if you, if if you make changes to to your Azure functions independently. Um, you could release these independently, which is so. If you have a problem with your Azure function, why would you trigger the C the CRM pipeline? Um, so th that gives you that flexibility. Um, at the same time, I mean, there are ways where even if you don't have changes in your CRM pipeline, you could still skip the import of the solution if the version hasn't changed. Um, I think if you put them in the same repository and have the same pipeline, then you would always have to release them together. Um, so, for example, if you're deploying the CRM pipeline, you will have to deploy the Azure functions unless you want to do something clever in the source code to see whether there has been any co any specific commits to that folder relating to the Azure function, and if there has been, then generate a new build artifact and do a release, otherwise skip. Um, so there's, there's a number of different ways to kind of do things, I think, depending on your project setup and what you're looking to achieve. But I think that the dependency bit is a little bit more tricky because if your Azure function, for example, is an external API, then it's um, you know it, it, it may have a different life cycle than your Dynamics, so you you know it may be a little bit more difficult to to track dependencies. Um, any more questions? I know we're kind of running out of time as well. Yeah, there's loads. Um, I'd encourage people to speak <coughs> up, actually. Um, because, Maybe we just need um, to have a Q&A at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we need to do this again. 
Um, so I'll, I'll call out the last question. Okay. Do you think it's best practice to perform a backup perform uh, in deploying? I'm not sure if that makes sense. Uh, is it a best practice to do a backup? Um, I think backup these days is one of those things that is you know very easy to do and it doesn't cause you any issues. So I would always you do a backup. I can't remember a scenario where I had to actually roll back from a backup, but it just gives you that peace of mind. If you have a backup, something goes wrong, you can make a decision at that point in terms of whether you want to use it or not. But if you don't have it, then, you know, then it's not the same situation. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Bill. And um, thank you so much for this informative uh, talk. And thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to end the call here. Um, stay on the line if you are joining for the next presenter, but I'm going to stop recording now. Okay, Thank thanks you. everyone. Bye. Enjoy the rest of the event.